So we're going to get on to the environmental medicine panel here. We've got an epic lineup. Just this week in the New York Times, there was an article saying, is your house making you sick? Talking about mold and toxins in the house. We're really excited to have this year for the Functional Forum a sponsor, a new sponsor called Health eHabitats. It's healthehabitats.com. They come into your house. They'll work out the mold. They'll work out the air filter, the water filter, all the junk in your house. We're glad that they're, they're here today. And um, it couldn't be more appropriate. We're going to have environmental... Uh, medicine conversations in all of the functional forum sessions moving forward. So I want to welcome to the stage, uh, we've got a, a dream team of, uh, of uh, panelists for this uh, environmental medicine panel. First, uh, a great friend of ABC and a you know, legendary doctor in the city now. He's uh, you know, a great, uh, I'm a big fan of his work and um, his writing and his engagement with the community. He's really making a big difference in his patients' lives and also uh, a lot of other people. Dr. Frank Lippmann. We mentioned uh, her already a few times. The Environmental Working Group is just about the most awesome charity out there and i um, really excited to host her here at ABC in, uh, in New York, the Executive Director, Heather White. And then last but not least, one of our big fans at the uh, Functional Forum. He is the past president of the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. He is an allergist. He is a mold specialist. And um, we're very, very proud and excited to have him on the team, Dr. Morton Teach. Okay. How are we doing? I'm going to stick with this one. Can I stick with the switch? Go back to this one. Okay. So, Heather, if you don't mind starting with you, you must be extremely proud to be working for an organization that is kicking ass and taking names in the environmental world. And we're very proud of the work. What do you, just to sort of set the standard and, and maybe um, freak everyone else out into action, how do you, how do you sort of see the, 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 the way the environment's changed over, say, even the last 50 years? Well, you know, when uh, I am actually not a doctor, I'm a jurist doctor, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. And in 1999, when I graduated from law school, I remember telling several of my colleagues that I wanted to do environmental law. And uh, just for the younger people in the audience, that sounds like it was 15 years ago. It was not actually 15 years ago. It was just a, it was just a couple of years ago. Um, but when I told several of my colleagues, they said, well, why would you go into environmental law? I mean, that's, we're all done. And I thought, oh my gosh, what is, I mean, of course we don't have uh, lakes catching on fire anymore. I mean, we did have tre tremendous change with the Clean Air Act, with the Clean Water Act, and with all of the federal laws that were passed in the early 70s, the creation of the EPA. But the fact is, we haven't seen a major federal environmental law passed since 1996, and those were amendments to the Safe Drinking Water Act. And what we're seeing is not only that, that we had this change, what's happened in the last 100 years is the toxic chemical revolution. We really don't know basic questions to answers about low dose toxic chemicals that we're exposed to every day from consumer products. So what we do know is that industrial chemical pollution begins in the womb. It begins right at birth. And we know this because of all these studies that are showing several of them that Environmental Working Group did that show that pollution actually is in newborn babies. But what we don't know is what is the impact of these, these small, low-dose exposures over time, and what do they do in combination? And so one of the things that we really are striving to do is make sure that people understand is that protecting the environment is all about protecting your health. That's so, that's so great, and I guess that's why you did the um, book with Latham, you know, get them while they're early. I think it's, uh, you get them while they're young, and even before, I think it's in a big part. You know, you mentioned that we don't really know, you know, what these causes are, these low-dose toxins, but I'm going to bring in Frank here because you're the master of epigenetics, you know, and understanding from, you know, from functional medicine. You know, that is our genes interacting with our environment. What do you think is the sort of the... the the core, what, it, what is happening when these toxins interact with, uh, you know, with our, our genes? Well, um, before I answer that, I just want to say a couple of words, just acknowledging some um, giants in this movement. One who's, who's reading his text. Um, 
there, there, there's, there, there's some giants in this movement. I've been around a long I think time. He's but, tweeting actually. But, but these people have been around a really long time. So Jim Gordon, thank you for Woo. mentoring all of us. Leo Gallen, thank you, Leo. I mean, Leo and Jim were my, were before me. I mean, I'm an old man. I'm a father. These guys are the grandfathers of the movement. So thank you for all that amazing work. And thank you, ABC, Susan, Amy, Paula, Paulette, for supporting us right from the beginning, for being there for us through thick and thin. I mean, it's an amazing to have an institution like this to support our work. So thank you. Sorry, I had to... Um, <laughs> And then environmental working group has been so, so important for all of us. So what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> so okay, even well, if we, do, we can't, you know, the low dose chemical, right. low dose toxicity over time, what would you imagine is happening with your understanding of epigenetics? Well, I, I, the way I see this is, I mean, we do have a detoxification system, although we never get taught it at, at medical school. Our bodies are detoxing all the time and... Um, Unfortunately, the amount of toxins are so great now that it's overloaded our system. And as Leo was talking, I mean, the more I do this, um, I have to agree with what Leo said. I think it's all about the microbiome. And the toxicity that is coming from our gut is like this huge load that, I mean, it's great to know about all the toxins on the outside, but we, on some level, are ignoring all these toxins being created in our gut um, and in, in, in our bodies in general. So I think we've just been, flo we, we've been flooded with all these toxins and we're all struggling to, to get by and, and try and deal with them. Um, so uh, what I often focus on, and this is one of the, you know, I started out in, in, in China, I started out as a doctor in a past life and then I, I went into Chinese medicine and what, you know, one of the first things my Chinese medicine teachers told me, Harriet Bainfeld and Ephraim Korngold, who wrote uh, Between Heaven and Earth, was the, the gut, the, the stomach, spleen, the earth, is where it's all happening. And they always used to teach, if you don't know what's going on, you, t you treat the gut. And there was a famous uh, herbalist that used to come and teach at Mark Seam School many years ago, Simon Mills. I don't know, you probably, none of you have been were around when Simon used to come. And he always used to teach us as well, in every tradition, every herbal tradition around the world, when you don't know what to do, you treat the gut. So it's interesting that I think it's all coming around to the gut and the microbiome and toxicity. So what I do is, I mean, you know, it's obviously we try to teach people about cosmetics they put on their skin um, and environmental pollution, but I really focus on the gut and trying to treat the gut and try to kill the bad bacteria, give good bacteria. I mean, it's very complicated. But I always get back to treating the gut because I see that as a core system of spewing out all these toxins and the inflammation. So what sort of difference do you think it would make if in primary care, primary care right now in America serves no real purpose. Essentially you come in and you get sort of sent to a specialist and there's no real value in that transaction. What do you think would be a new, if you had a new model of primary care where you were just going for the gut straight away, what, what sort of difference do you think that would make to medicine and well, chronic disease? Right. Well, the new model would be we would eliminate gastroenterologists <laughs> because, you know, the problem is you go to a gastroenterologist thinking they're going to take care of, of a, an important system and they don't. So, you, you know, people come in and, well, they've been to the top specialist in New York and he w told me... Um, I've got irritable bowel or whatever it is, and he gives them a drug, as, as Leo said, which makes it worse. So the lack of understanding, the misunderstanding of such a key system by these top specialists, I think, is, is pretty scary. So to me, if we could change that, we would change a whole host of things. Sort of take the specialty of gastroenterology out of the gastroenterologist's hands. I think that would make a huge difference. I think that's a great, great, yeah, but I love that. I don't I think it could... I hope I hope there are no gastroenterologists in the audience. <laughs> well, you know, on the Evolution of Medicine Summit, we had the evolution of gastroenterology today, and I didn't pick a gastroenterologist for that exact reason. Dr. Ron Hoffman's in the house somewhere. Uh, did, a, did a great job. And actually, we have um, Dr. Robin Chutkan on the summit, and she's speaking on the pediatric day, and she is a gastroenterologist. And I said... So, Dr. Chutkan, um, you know, you must have known all about the microbiome right from your training. It was like, obviously, a set-up question because she 
learns about the gut, went to school for the gut, and they had no idea that there were trillions of bacteria there, even 15 years ago. And so um, it's really exciting to see, and I think there might be a few more ologists that we could um, dispatch with if we did that well. So, Dr. Teach, I want to come to you because um, you're really an environmental medicine specialist, and you know, I, I, you're an allergist. Uh, what percentage of these allergy patients or other things are you seeing do you think are as a, as a reflection of... Um, on one hand, the gut, and on the other hand, the home environment. Initially, I was a pediatrician. And so I started in pediatrics, then I went into allergy immunology, and then I ended up meeting the group of clinical ecology, which has become the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. And they were about 20 years ahead of everybody else. I'm also on the staff at Sinai, and it's very difficult walking in there and having them treat the symptoms and not looking at the cause. I think the cause is the most important problem. It's balance, balance in the body, and that's what we're dealing with. The gut is very, very important. The gut and brain, we almost started a, a department at Columbia at one point, but they nixed the whole thing. Now, finally, it's coming out. Thank God. Uh, I'm looking, I originally started with uh, Dr. Ben Feingold, famous for the Feingold diet. I was his resident the year before. And we were considered, he wrote a book on artificial coloring and flavoring, which we're now looking at as chemical sensitivity. And we, I used to give diets out to patients. We did the salicylate-free diet. And we found that they got better. A lot of the patients got better. And it was, we didn't know why all the time. But then we would take dust and mold and put it under the skin, and we could provoke symptoms. It's interesting because a lot of the dust and mold cross-react with foods and so on. A lot of the chemicals cross-react with artificial coloring and flavoring and many of the chemicals that we put in our body. They just got me up here, so I didn't prepare, so I'm <laughs> sorry, I apart, apologize. We started looking, I got involved, I went to a conference given by Dr. Truss. William Crook sat next to me and we got involved with Candida. And there's a book called The Yeast Connection. Somewhere or other I got, I'm in there about four or five times. And we got involved with Candida and we found, again, we're going back looking at the gut, the balance of the gut. And what I find is looking at the Candida, looking at the parasites, looking at what probiotics you give. This makes such a difference in so many of my patients. But I also look at their environment. I go look at, I talk to them about what's in their house, what mold. Mold has become a really big problem because we've closed the windows, we've closed the doors, and we've sealed everything. And suddenly we are <laughs> looking at mold in the ventilation system, in every uh, other thing. The mold in the body and the mold in the environment and the mold outside all seem to add together and cause toxic chemicals and allergic problems. I can take mold, put it under the skin, and reproduce symptoms with patients. We can put another dose under the skin and they'll get better. And I've been able to trigger. We think we're going through the matrix, not from cell to cell. So it's, uh, we're basically talking about harmonics. And a lot of the body works on harmonics in the sense that if you give a little too much, you'll get worse. If you give a little too little, the low dose, you can also get into trouble. Or you can turn them off just like that. I've had patients, we've taken serotonin and put it under the skin and suddenly they stop being depressed in the office. We're giving it as sublingual drops. I think I've said enough. No, I mean, that's super interesting. And I think mold is, is a huge issue, especially up here in the Northeast. It's wet, um, you know, you're dealing with a lot of those kind of things. I just want to go back to something that Alison said is that, you know, personal, th there's a lot of opportunity for us to each take personal responsibility here, Heather. And I know that's a, a big moment there with what you, you mentioned. But um, you, you were one of the guys with the environmental working group that's really fighting for us on a bigger scale uh, because, you know, there's only so, you know, there's only so much that we can do individually. What, what do you see as the, the focus of EWG in the next, in the next few years? Is, because there's so many things you could be working on, air, water, mold, all these types of things. Where, where do you see the priority? 
Well, we, first of all, I have to say thanks to, to Leo because I really think this whole Planet U and this whole concept of the intersection between the environment and the health is so important because what we really want, and more and more people are connecting the dots between the environment and their health, we want people to understand that the environment isn't where you go on vacation. It's what you interact with on a daily basis. It's the air that you breathe, it's the water that you drink, it's the food that you eat. So. Your question is, you know, where are we headed now? So we've got a lot of environmental issues to tackle, as you know. We work in three major areas at EWG. The first is environmental health and toxics. The second is sustainable agriculture and food. And the third is energy and water. What we're really going to focus on is updating our federal toxics law. This is a law that hasn't been updated since 1976, and it's the reason that the 60,000 chemicals that are used in consumer products are not proven safe before they go on the market. And it's one of these things that's really hard to believe that the law could be that bad. So that's one of our big initiatives that we're working on. We're also working on updating our federal cosmetics law that was last passed, not making this up, in 1938 and has not been updated by Congress. And a lot of the ingredients, almost all the ingredients that we're using are not actually tested for safety. They are by companies and those results are in file cabinets, but they're not actually required to be tested for safety before they go on the market. The third thing is we're really gonna be working on food. We have a new product coming out called the Food Database, which if any of you are familiar with our research and we really believe that data, and I know that Robin is gonna be talking about this later, data is a way for us to personalize these environmental connections. So we have a great resource called the Skin Deep, which is the cosmetics guide. Thank you. Thank you very much for those of you who know it. So you can find out what you're wearing each day. We're doing this for food, and this is going to be launched in October, where we're going to be really focusing on food additives. What are they? And I know a lot of people in this room are really focused on whole foods, but a lot of America is not. And we really need to get the word out, and doctors are on the front lines for that. So we're going to be working on food additives to the 10,000 chemicals that are used in processed food. What are they? What do we do? We know at least a third of them. We don't have, as the public, any information about what those additives are. So those are the kind of main areas that we're working on. We have a lot of work to do. And just, James, I know you've heard me say this before, and Allison, I think you just nailed it. Democracy is not a spectator sport. You know, we really need everybody to get in the game. As much as we need to really promote companies that are doing the right thing and creating all these great opportunities, we really need to push practitioners. We have to change the law. We have to change policy so everyone has an equal opportunity for health and for wellness. And that's what we're fighting for each day. Absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Lippmann, I'd just like to ask you, I mean, maybe either of you could answer this, but what do you see as the role of, you, you mentioned that so clearly, the inner ecology and the outer ecology and, and people learning from their own body. I think this is a huge part. Doc, what, what role do you think doctors have to play in this like, massive education process? Well, I think, <clears throat> I think doctors are teachers. We need to be teach. We should be, first of all, practicing what we preach, and second of all, teaching our patients. So we should be encouraging and pushing them to buy clean cosmetics. Um, you know, I am, have been blessed to have tons of health coaches working for me, um, working with me, sorry, not for me. Um, but they hand out tons, I mean, when someone leaves our office now, and this, this is new and, and I find it fascinating, when people leave our office now, they have the tons of information and always environmental working group is one of the, is one of the links. But you've got to keep educating patients on, on how, you know, not only how to get involved, but you know, what's happening. So I think doctor as teacher, which has always been the case, is crucial. So there's doctor as healer, which is fine, but we need to be teachers. We need to be teaching the public and actually you know, um, getting them riled and ready to go. So you, um, Part of our role, part of my role anyway, that I see as a doctor is to needle the system and to really teach people to take on the system. You know, I keep saying this, some of you have heard me talk about this before. I grew up in South Africa during apartheid, and the feeling I have towards the system here and towards the medical system here is exactly the same feeling I had towards apartheid in South Africa growing up. You're looking around that it's crazy. Am I crazy that this is such a rotten system? 
Um, and it's the same thing. It's the same thing with the medical system. It's the same thing with the whole corporate system and what's going on. So we all need to get involved. You know, we don't unfortunately have a Nelson Mandela, but, you know, we all need to get involved. And I, I think, thank you, Alison, I think activism is really important. So my, what I say to doctors, you've got to, like, get your patients involved and teach them. Just feed them this information. You know, have tons of handouts, tons of... You don't even have to have handouts anymore. Resources. There's so many great web resources to turn people on and educate people. So thank you, ewg.org, for making our life so much easier. Yeah, I, thank I you, you for all the plugs, <laughs> by yeah. the way. <laughs> I think I, you just made such a good point there, Doc. And on the summit, I know we spoke about your evolution of your practice to working with health coaches. And... The evolution of medicine is such that, you know, this is not something that can get done to you. You know, medicine was always something that was done to you as a patient and you were just, you know, it was being done to you. Detoxification can't be that because it's happening in the 167 hours a week that you're not in the doctor's office. And uh, the one great, great quote from the, from the summit that I just want to share that Dr. Lippmann said, he said, health coaches are the nurses of the wellness revolution. And I just thought that was such an amazing quote because you know these doctors do need help to be able to change lifestyle this is not a skill set that doctors were taught and so i think that you know you're setting an amazing uh, example there for um for a new model so one last question for you heather what are people doing about the environment that they think is helping but really isn't okay this is a great question because this is actually advice that i give Okay, so my advice is to buy green, right? Buy green cleaners, buy safer cosmetics, think about the chemicals that you're bringing into your home. But this is also a thing people think they're doing for the environment and their health that sometimes they aren't because there aren't any rules and regulations with respect to using the marketing claim green. So you really need to become a label reader. And just like Dr. Lippman was saying, there's some great resources out there, great guides of what to look for, but it's not enough to grab something on the shelf that says it's green or eco-friendly. You need to dig a little deeper and make sure you're really making the right choice. Absolutely. Well, um, maybe we can take uh, a question. I, will, I didn't want to look like I was looking at my phone during the interview, but I can check Twitter <laughs> to see if anyone's tweeting in for questions for these guys. Um, how are we doing on time here, Paula? Good? All right. So um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Maybe actually, Dr. Teach, I just want to, to, to ask you uh, as you go through this, how, do, how does someone, how do you identify when someone's in your office, how do you identify whether these issues are stemming from their home or if it's an internal issue? The first thing that I do is ask the right questions. Because what I do is I try to teach people to think. And they know as much as I do in many cases. And it's a dialogue, not me telling them what to do. And what I find is if I ask the right questions, they'll give me the right answers. They'll give themselves the right answers. And I think that's the most important thing that I've learned to do over the years. I've learned a lot, but with the internet and with everything else, most of my patients come in and know as much, if not more, than I do about the subjects. And I've learned from them, and the trick is to be open and go with the idea that you don't know much. If you don't know much, then you always can learn. Most of the doctors I know know everything, and that scares me, because there's always a way to go. And the point is that everybody's an individual. And therefore, you have to treat each person as an, not treat, but look at each other, person as an individual. And it's forming a dialogue with a patient that you can work back and forth. You have a coach, you have a person. Who's the coach? I'm not sure. I've learned a lot. And the point is that I, I'm originally a pediatrician. I do a lot of work with autism and ADD and so on. It's the same thing as cancer. It's the same thing as arthritis. I had a patient that came in and she was in the emergency room at Sinai every night with asthma or arthritis, one or the other. Well, she came in and we treated her fungus toe and she totally cleared up. The point is the body's connected and you have to look at the whole body, not just one component. The GI tract is vitally, vitally important, but you also have to look where else is coming from. Again, I look at toenails. I've cured more people by treating their toenail and the rest of their body's gotten better. Artificial coloring and flavoring, all the stuff you're doing is right on the nose. We're looking, we've looked at chemicals for years and I see lots of patients just by changing the environment, change their chemical around, they get better. And they've been to every doctor, they've been to all the specialists, but the specialists look at 
the one system and they try to treat the symptoms. Let's treat the individual. I think that's a beautiful place to leave it. Thank you so much. Let's have a round of applause for the environmental panel. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.